Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our worship for this morning. Um, first of all, just to say that uh, I hope you don't mind me being slightly pared down in terms of vestments. Melted priest isn't a good look. So, you know, forgive me if I'm not wearing the full regalia, uh, but in clergy circles, we usually cheekily refer to it as going to work and putting on our dressing gowns just to keep warm. So, you know, forgive me if I'm taking a more practical approach this morning. You are, however, very welcome to our worship for this morning. So let's begin with some opening words. We come from scattered lives to this sanctuary, to seek our unity in the Spirit, to seek the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek the peace of God the Father. God's people have gathered. God the Father of our days and years, we set this time apart for you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, form us in the likeness of Christ the Son, so that our lives may glorify you. My brothers and sisters, not out of dread or fear, but believing that God is faithful to forgive, let us rid ourselves of what we no longer need to carry. In a dark and disfigured world, we have not held out the light of the Father's gift of life to those who need it most. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In a hungry and despairing world, we have failed to share the bread of Christ with those who hunger. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. In a cold and loveless world, we have kept the love and comfort of the Holy Spirit to ourselves. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In the beginning, God saw all that had been made and declared it good. And in Christ, to a weary world and to guilty people, Father God allowed for the recovery of our lost goodness by declaring, Behold, I make all things new. So in the power of the Spirit, may God forgive you and restore you, and so fill you with love for the earth that you yearn to care for all of creation. Amen. Now I'm going to do exactly as Bishop Jonathan did last week and to offer you the choice. For those of you who would like to stand for the various bits of the service that we used to traditionally stand for, you're very welcome to do so. But if you're more comfortable remaining seated, that's fine too. So we join together in the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. So let's pray. God of truth, help us to keep to your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom, that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. And so I'd now like to invite Arthur to come forward, who's going to read our Old Testament reading. Listen for the ones whose thoughts are not false, whose word, words are not our words. The first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
And the Hebrew said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and your woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Um, Julian, would you please read our gospel? Alleluia, alleluia, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. One God who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. Alleluia. In the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a, a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. He, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parable. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His hand has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. When Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting round him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Give thanks to the one whose word is life. Blessed be God forever. Thank you. Oh, I never did much like snakes. Which might give you some idea of where I'm going this morning. And yes, this one's for you, Arthur. Gardens, nakedness, fig leaves, talking snakes and curses. What are we to make of all of it? What I say this morning has been certainly not started, but inspired by an email conversation that I had with Arthur a few weeks back, who was doing a school project and was asking me some questions about Genesis. So before we start, I'd like you to do something for me just for a minute. Could I ask all of you please to close your eyes? Now, I'd like you to imagine with me that we're sitting somewhere in the wilderness, on a log around a roaring campfire, and you can see a million stars in the dark sky overhead. We are together with our family and friends. It's the end of a long day. The adults are weary, the children are tired, leaning against their parents with heavy eyes. And just then, as the fire pops and crackles, one of the children says, Granddad, tell us the next part of the story. What happens after the man and lady meet? 
Granddad chuckles and stands in the way of the storyteller. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And as the campfire pops and crackles in the night sky, the children are spellbound as Granddad begins to weave his tale, the story of the beginnings. Okay, open your eyes, please. When you read Genesis, I wonder what you think is actually going on. Do you believe that this is a literal account of the creation of the world, the first people and their first sins, and that our world began as the Bible describes in a seven-day creation process? Or do you believe that our world really began through a million-year evolutionary process as Darwin described? Or perhaps a third option, are you simply not sure? If the last one, you wouldn't be alone. So that's why this morning I'd like to take the opportunity through the lens of Genesis to talk about what the Bible actually is. First of all, this is not a book. I know it looks like a book because quite obviously it's bound in a hard cover and presented with the nice title of Holy Bible, so you can be forgiven for thinking it's a book. But actually, this is a library. It's an entire library of 66 different books, certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit, but written by different authors in different generations and diverse cultures over approximately a 3,400 year period. Now, take a moment to think back over the last thousand years or so of human history. How much has human understanding and knowledge developed in that period? Now consider how differently do we live today from people over 5,000 years ago. You see, when we read the Bible, we have to understand what we're reading. Just like any library, it's filled with multiple genres of books. Poetry, prophecy, biography, and myth, among others. Now this last one is what concerns us today. And I want to be clear that when I say myth, I don't mean myth as in false. I mean the other definition of myth, which is stories. Genesis is classed as a book of myth, a book of stories. Stories that might not have happened exactly as recorded, but they serve a different purpose to that of literal truth. They're stories that help to explain the beginnings in the same way that a tribe of indigenous peoples will tell stories about their origins as a way of teaching the next generation of the tribe. That's why I had to do that imaginative exercise. Because back at the point, 5,000 or so years ago, when the stories of Genesis were first told, they were being told orally, as one generation passed them down to the next. And that's what Genesis is doing. Genesis is not science, so it's not in conflict with science, with Darwin, with evolution, or anything like that. Look at it this way. It would be like trying to compare the work of a landscape artist with that of a medical researcher. Both are skills, both have a purpose, but both approach their work in very different ways. This is also one of the reasons and I'd be interested to know how many of you have spotted this, that there are two completely different creation stories in the book of Genesis. 
The first one starts from Genesis 1, 1, and it goes to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And this one is a creation story that's, it's a little bit like inviting you to look on the events from far away, from space. It's got a cosmic sort of feeling about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's a particular type of story, told in a particular type of way. And you may or may not know, or indeed remember, that when the first astronauts landed on the moon, they recited that story, because they were so overwhelmed with seeing the earth from space, but the only thing they could think to do was to recite that Genesis story from that perspective. But then, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, starts again with a whole new, different creation story. And the reason that we know it's a new and separate one is that it starts, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In other words, the story is starting again. But this time it's told in more intimate, holy terms, because we read about God creating a garden and putting people in the garden and walking with them in the noon of the day. It's still a creation story, but it's told from a different perspective. It is like two artists looking at the same subject from different angles. Okay, I think you get the idea. But you'd be forgiven for wondering, what are the implications of this for our faith? If Genesis is just a story, then is the rest of the Bible true? That comes back to genre. Because there are some books of the Bible and characters in it that we can verify from elsewhere in the historic record that existed. Or there are some stories that even if they might have been different to how the Bible records them, they repeat in multiple cultures. For example, the story of Noah's Ark. Let's face it, it would have taken a pretty big boat to get two or seven of every single animal on Earth onto it. Not to mention the difficulties of them traveling, say, from the Arctic to the Middle East. However, there is a story of a great flood repeated in almost every single ancient culture at that time. So that gives us the idea that a flood did happen, it just might not have necessarily been two by two into the ark. Although as an aside, some of you who watch the news might be aware that Noah's Ark has been impounded in Ipswich this week for being unseaworthy. And if you think I'm joking, go check out BBC News. It has. You see, when we look at the Bible as being holy and literally true in every single word that we read, that has a term, and it's called biblical infallibility. And there are some Christians and some churches, to be honest, particularly in America, who do believe wholeheartedly that every single word in this library is literally true as written. But this is where being Anglican or being part of the Church of England comes in, because we take a different approach. I wonder if you remember the example that Bishop Jonathan gave last week when he was trying to describe having a binitarian faith as opposed to a trinitarian faith when he asked if you could imagine trying to balance on a two-legged stool. It wouldn't be possible, because you'd constantly try, be trying to compensate and wibbling and wobbling, because you need a full tripod, like on my camera there, of three legs to support you. Well, one of the examples that some people will give for the Anglican Church traditionally is that it's like a three-legged stool. There are three parts to our church heritage and tradition. And this is scripture, reason, and tradition. 
and we can thank Anglican theologian Richard Hooker for this one. In other words, all three of these things are important. And imagine it like the legs of a stool that somebody has to balance on. So, we look to scripture for our knowledge of God. We look then to reason to determine what type of genre of literature are we reading? What purpose does this particular bit of scripture serve? Because let's face it, God created our brains and God expects us to use them. And then we look to tradition to consider how the Christians who have gone before us have interpreted a particular bit of scripture. And we blend all three of those together as our way of understanding God and God's relationship with humankind and the world, God's relationship with faith, with the church, and then our relationship with other members of the church. This particular approach that's more traditional to the Anglican church says that scripture contains all things that are necessary for salvation. Now what that means is that in order to know God, to understand our relationship as human beings in the world with God, everything we need is contained in scripture. But remember that in scripture it also says, now I see in a mirror dimly, but then I shall see face to face. Because St. Paul acknowledged that our best efforts to understand and to grasp the truth of our faith will only ever be dim while we're in this world. And we won't know 100% the truth until we're face to face with God. Or the writer of Hebrews, who says, faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. So, is Genesis true? Yes, in as much as any story will contain elements of truth or allegory to help us learn, explore, ask questions, and to begin to understand. Fundamentally, that story that Arthur read for us this morning does tell us some important things. First, the world loves us and wants to be in a close personal relationship Secondly, that sadly human beings as a whole have time and time again rejected God's way and have tried to go our own way. And sadly, there are consequences for that. But thirdly, that God always offers us more chances as the entire arc of scripture shows to come back and to come back and to come back. But was there actually a talking snake? An apple? A woman who was responsible for the entire fall of mankind? No, probably not. Every story needs a bit of colour to make it interesting, after all. You see, fundamentally, faith and science are not in opposition to one another. Because God created them both. Landscape artist and medical researcher, they're both skills, but they look at things in different ways. And let's face it, if you look through the Gospels, Jesus told stories all the time. Not necessarily because the events described in those stories, the parables, were intended to be literally true, but because Christ knew that we learn better when we hear truths through stories than through an academic lecture. So, when it comes to faith, go and ask questions, go read the stories, go experience the mystery. Because that's what faith is all about. <clears throat> so I'd like to invite you to say together with me the response of our faith. And so let us affirm what we believe. We believe in Creator God, the beginning and source of all life, of light and dark, stars, sky and sea, 
plants and all creatures. We believe in Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the light to live by. Born of a woman, he grew in wisdom, storyteller, teacher, and healer, a friend, an outcast. He walked the hills of Galilee, sailed the lake with fishermen, lived the way he taught. He was betrayed, rejected, and crucified by the power, died and was buried. On the third day, he rose again and was seen by his friends for a time. His kingdom is present on earth. We believe in sustainer God, the Holy Spirit of wind and fire, who moves over the waters, awakening love and faith within us. We believe in the mystery that is God. Amen. So I'd like to invite Faith Forward, who's going to lead us in our prayers this morning. we are shown God's compassion and mercy. Let us pray that love in our lives, in the church and in the world. Let compassion and mercy be the hallmarks of our church life and all its activities. Let us be noticeable by their shining in our behaviour and our conversations. Disrupt any rules which block them out. Lord of love, let us go and leave our world be done. Let compassion and mercy take root in every institution, policy and structure. Let them challenge accepted wrongs and disturb complacency. Lord of love, let us go and leave our world be done. Let compassion and mercy guard every doorway and fill every room. Let them colour each encounter and drive every decision. Lord of love, let the glory be your will be done. Let compassion transform our attitudes to all whose illness or frailty makes them marginalised, ignored or despised. Let there be healing of all damaged self-perception and restoration of all jarred human dignity. Lord of love, let compassion accompany the dying and welcome them into eternity. Lord of love, let compassion and mercy blossom in all of us as we live out our thankfulness to the God of love for all his goodness to us. We just spend a moment in quiet and remembering all those on our hearts this morning that are not with us this morning for whatever reason. We especially remember those who are unwell. If you'd like to say out loud any names on your heart this morning. Especially think about Karen. For all those within our family who may be unwell this morning. We pray that they feel the presence of God around them. Merciful Father, accept the baby's prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. And as our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father. Peace from his Son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the triune God be always with you. And also with you. So before we go this morning, we ask for God's blessing to be upon us. God the Father, who first loved us and made us accepted in the beloved Son, bless you. God the Son, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, bless you. Amen. God the Holy Spirit, who sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts, bless you. Amen. The blessing of the one true God, to whom be all love and all glory for time and eternity, come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord.